Welcome back to the code, Anne. We read novels such as Ready Player One, Snow Crash, uh, which were like a big inspiration of Decentraland. Welcome to <laughs> joke. Back in 2013, I got into crypto, uh, where crypto was only Bitcoin at that time. What else has happened? Bitcoin is above 30K. Amen. Amen. We had Atari uh, in the center. Yeah. If Apple is building something for it and they've created it, I mean, that obviously means that you guys have you know, started something quite early and you've started the trend and action. Hey everyone, welcome back to Decoded by Diverse. Today we have Yamal, the Executive Director of Decentraland. Hi Yamal, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? Hey Dina, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me here. No worries, we're really happy to have you. I mean, Decentraland is, is a really big uh, you know, company in the Web3 space, specifically within the metaverse, so I'm really excited to speak with you. Yeah, so, for sure. We have been for years here. I know, I know. But it's good. We finally get to get to do this. I mean, we've been trying to plan also for a bit of time. So it's it's good we we've gotten the we've gotten to this. Um maybe what we can start off with, I think it would be really cool just if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and like what you do with Decentraland and you know how you even got there in the first place. So a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. So I'm a software engineer. That's my my background. I study in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, back in 2013, I got into crypto, uh, where crypto was only Bitcoin at that time. Uh, and it was a huge conference in, in Buenos Aires with companies all around the world. We have Andreas Antonopoulos speaking. And my mind was totally blown back then. Um, so in 2014, I decided to work full time in the crypto space. I work for BitPay, which is a payment processor at the States. Uh, we develop open source software, uh, like a library to create Bitcoin applications. Uh, we share a, a private space in Buenos Aires as a, like an office. And uh, yeah, we spend like many lunches and a lot of time uh, discussing about the potential of blockchain. We were a lot uh, into gaming and we read novels such as Ready Player One, Snow Crash, uh, which were like a big inspiration of Decentraland. Um, yeah, so 2015, we, we created like a, the first prototype of what Decentraland was, just a 2D uh, grid of pixels and you can like mine pixels using your computer. Um, then we make a second version in 2016, which was like a fully fledged 3D world. It was also VR ready. Uh, we didn't have Ethereum back then. So like we base it on a fork of a Bitcoin node. Uh, that's an interesting piece of story. And yeah, and 2017, we decided to, to migrate it to Ethereum uh, as a new base layer. And yeah, and I participated up to that point in like in the Central project as an early contributor, co-author of the white paper. Uh, then Esteban and Ari took the lead on building like the, the initial version that was actually launched on 2020. And I rejoined the, the project two years ago on first on the community side. Um, the Central has a DAO, uh, a decentralized autonomous organization, which is kind of a, a community fund that uh, supports the community and their initiatives. Um, the Central is also an open source protocol, so anyone can actually contribute to the platform. Uh, so I, I started contributing there, and very recently, like two months ago, I joined the Central Foundation as the new uh, chief executive director. So happy, happy oh. to be uh, here again. Oh wow! Well, congratulations. That's quite that's quite the like extensive background. I was gonna, I, I like, I want to try to pull bits and pieces from it. So Ready Player One is one of these, obviously 
when we talk about the metaverse, it's one of my first questions is how is this inspired it or like how likely do you see that the metaverse will get to this point? And I mean, for you guys, you've been around for quite a long time. You've been building from really early days. How would you describe what the Decentraland experience is like in simple in, in simple terms? I mean, this is, let's, you know, t tailor this towards maybe people who don't really know too much about the Web3 world. Um, mm -hmm. How would you, like, if some, if some people are looking to get into it and, you know, they, they're interested in hopping into the world of Web3, how would you describe what Decentraland is like? Yeah, so in simple terms, uh, Decentraland, like you say, 3D virtual world uh, that is focused on like the social aspect in which like, you build your identity and you can traverse the world using your avatar. Uh, it also features the user uh, generated content. Uh, like all you can see has been created by other people. It's not mm -hmm. like a uh, yeah, that's the main part. Uh, you can customize your avatar uh, wearing clothes that were built and designed by other creators. And there is a very important social part of uh, the experience, like getting to know new people, in, engaging like in a gaming experience or an event. Um, that, that, that's yeah. pretty much the, the overall. Then you can find your own path in the metaverse, such as in real life. Do you think that you guys will ever get to the point of the Ready Player One, you know, level yeah. of, you think so? Totally. Yeah, totally. It may take some years to, to get to the hardware uh, needed to have that, that kind of experience. But we, we actually started uh, because we totally believe that that was the future of humankind. And back then we saw how Facebook bought Oculus. Uh, the company developing like a virtual reality headset and we said like oh my god this is going to be like something huge and uh, like if we're going to to like our kids are going to be in a computer all day plugged in such a, a fashion we need to build it like in with the right foundations you know like we don't want like to live in a metaverse owned by a private company yeah no that that makes a lot of sense. Um, this kind of brings me a little bit towards, um, I think something that's really been a trending topic in the last few weeks has been Apple's vision pros. Um, mm -hmm. How do you see that that's going to impact uh, one, Decentraland and two, the overall metaverse experience as a whole? Because some people are saying it's now outdated. It's made the metaverse seem very outdated. Um, people are a bit unsure like how this is going to affect uh, companies like yourselves within, you know, in the metaverse industry? Oh, in my opinion, this is 100% amazing. Like amazing news to see Apple getting into the hardware uh, of VR or AR. Uh, and the immersive experience of computing is like the next frontier and getting Apple into the game, it, it's really great for us. Um, also, they partnered up with Unity. Uh, which is pretty aligned with our current technology stack and also expertise. So uh, looking forward to, to get one of those headsets in my hands and start doing some tests. Yeah, I'm quite curious to see how it's going to be because I think they were saying something about, you know, this isn't really going to be for the metaverse. It's just going to be for their own, for their own experiences, for their own user um, experience. We'll see. They they have this interesting wheel, you know, the crown in which you can uh, go from like a path through and it's like more augmented reality and be fully immersed. Uh, so I think it's more up to the user or the, the task uh, they are doing, yeah. like if they want to be more augmented reality or more immersed. Um, yeah, f for us, it's like all on the totally immersed. No, I think, yeah, I think it's quite, it, it kind of says a lot also about the whole metaverse experience because the metaverse experience itself was created to happen out of, you know, out of a reality experience. And now with the Vision Pros, it just shows that this is like a universal thing. It's not just a Web3 um, fad. It just shows that this is global. If Apple is building something for it and they've created it, I mean, that obviously means that 
you guys have you know started something quite early and you've started the trend <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah super happy to to see i see it as a validation for the space for sure and the the user experience and like the main interactions uh, are yet to figure and i i believe the apple did an amazing job there on like for example pointing with your eyes and clicking your with your fingers that's a really good experience yeah. improvement on the overall experience uh, i'm i believe they they really nail it uh, on on that user aspect uh, and and that's something that the industry totally needs uh, most of the great ideas will be a uh, copy and imitated yeah. to other platforms as well 100%. And it's, of course, Apple that comes out with, like, the first, like, big one. <laughs> I mean, like, obviously, it has to be them. So while we're discussing, you know, the whole virtual reality experiences, um, another big player is Meta, obviously. And so they've, you know, they've got their Horizon Worlds VR. And although this is a concept that's not necessarily decentralized, but it does focus on the idea of going beyond a computer screen. How far do you see the metaverse to being, you know, available on all these VR devices that will be? Um, I, I'm also very bullish on the progress of Meta uh, on the hardware side. Uh, they have the, the cheapest headset out there that is a, a Quest two and the quest three coming up very soon and and i actually believe that headset is closer to like a wider option than like apple's version that has a price tag way above it um mm -hmm. so yeah on the on the hardware side i think meta is making great advancements to the technology on the software part on like the, the experience to what you can see in there and their vision and their take of like a, an immersive world. Um, I don't think it's as appealing for a, like creators and like building a huge community inside it. Uh, what we can see in this entrant is like the, the empowerment of creators, people who can make a living by designing digital clothes. Uh, they can like also on board brands uh, to like some events and like we give a lot of freedom to anyone to build an experience inside a, our version of what the metaverse should be and and i think that's the most important part and i don't see meta getting the, the full picture yet for metaverses in general i think that with with facebook changing their whole brand to meta I think that was like, obviously, for that was globally something that everyone was waiting for something massive. And I mean, I'm still waiting for from like a software perspective, the hardware perspective, they've they're very, obviously, they're more aligned with making it a very inclusive experience, like their prices are very reasonable. Apple's not necessarily but in Apple's as, as a product, I feel like they've also never really not necessarily been for everyone it's it's just more of an exclusive experience i think that's that's what yeah there is also an uh, i think a swift uh, change in the strategy uh, mark is taking uh, with their com his company uh because uh, facebook or meta always delivers software they always uh, been an application inside the app stores of other uh, applications he they are like the app inside the Google store or the uh, app store. And now they want to be like the hardware manufacturer. They want to be like the, they want to have their own store and have their own applications. So they want to be the distribution channel. And I think that that's really smart. Uh, and yeah, but I, I don't think that they want to own the, the whole experience. They, they want to be the platform and yeah, and welcome other uh, creators to, to build the applications there. Decentraland, as like you guys as a company, you've had the like the first mover advantage when it comes to the 3D blockchain metaverse experience. You've got quite a few competitors in the in the market that have much, you know, more extensive graphics in terms of, you know, the quality and everything about that. Do you, do you think you could tell us a little bit about how you guys are going to, you know, improve yours or, you know, compete with them and on a broader mm -hmm. picture as well, like how you guys plan to reach 
better graphics for the masses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I guess uh, it's been super interesting to see like newcomers get into the space and taking different decisions as we did back then uh, and see the ramifications of those decisions, the limitations of uh, su such design. Uh, one thing that, that we make, a decision we made very early on was to not be attached to a particular uh, engine. Uh, so we have like an uh, intermediary, our own language uh, that is used to design the scenes and the experiences inside the central. And um, at the moment, the current explorer, the, the current client is uh, using Unity game engine uh, and has this ability of uh, rendering the, the scenes in this language. Um, but we also have alternative clients, like in other engines, like in Rust. Uh, we have one in Babylon. Um, we have one in Godot, and we could have another one in Unreal Engine. So having this layer ensures that uh, we can switch the technology and the, all the content that has been created inside the engine can move from one to the other. Uh, so that was one decision, and I think like somehow future proofs the, the the project, and we can step up on on the engine uh, when when we see the right one. Um, so that's one decision. The second one is like the aesthetics and like the cartoonish low poly thing was something that uh, we wanted to push to ensure that it can run on a web browser, and eventually if there is a like a mobile headset based on an Android, we can also target to that uh, platform as well. Uh, so being kind of restrictive on the on the like amount of triangles and the definition, uh, we can later on uh, get a, a bigger audience. Uh, so that was a decision, but also we can change it in the future and, and, and make it like fully fledged uh, when, when we see the timing is right. Um, and I, I believe one of the decisions that is very important on, on, on our side is like the, the openness. Uh, like we don't, you don't need to partner with us in order to build content inside Decentral. Like uh, if you get access to like your name and Decentral name, you can build like a private isolated experience or you can get a land in the marketplace and you can build on our open world and you can use our tools and deploy directly to the world without talking with us at any point. Uh, and I think that's a very compelling uh, compared with other metaverses that are, are like double down on one technology and like they become the gatekeepers of like the whole experience. And if you want to build something there, you need to talk with them or partner with them. So uh, there are some trade-offs on uh, uh, yeah, the, how tight you want to be to the, the game engine and how open you want to be with your community of creators. So you said you were going to wait until the time is right. Do you have any plans for that in the future? Do you have any idea when that might be? Because you said you're also, you know, you're a software engineer, right? So you have mm -hmm. obviously, you know, you understand the technical side. I do not. <laughs> Originally, uh, we set to distribute this engine on web browsers. Uh, even though VR was like the long-term vision, uh, doing it on web first was like an strategic decision. Uh, and we are, for us, VR is the next frontier. And so we are waiting to see what, how the VR ecosystem unfolds uh, in the past year with Meta and now with Apple. Uh, this is like becoming a, like a, a thing really, really soon. Um, so yeah, for us next year, I will be like an, a very interesting year to, to test that. We are already investing in alternative clients and uh, VR uh, prototypes. Um, but we want to see what's the best technology, uh, and the right flat platform to build on top. Do you think that the best technology exists, not exists because obviously better will come but i mean from what you've seen so far everyone's building now on unreal engine 5 do you think that that's probably the best way for most people who are starting out now um unreal engine 5 is amazing on like the innovation of nanite and lumen like the the possibility of render like 
super huge 3D assets and also have like real time lighting. I think those two are like the most interesting innovations. Maybe they are the first movers and like in a year, like you have the same on Unity and many other engines as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know how far that a uh, competitive advantage will hold, um, but they are doing an amazing job. So, uh, I think like that's a very interesting target for us. Even though Epic Games has like a revenue model based on a, a percentage of uh, what you made there, and I guess for a, like an open metaverse, uh, that contract could be kind of tricky to secure. Uh, so we'll see. Let's discuss some privacy concerns that a lot of users have been, you know, have had in the past. Can you tell us a little bit about how? you guys have addressed user privacy concerns and then maybe a little bit more about the creative freedom, empowerment, opportunities that the world of Web3 offers. I think this applies to overall the Web3 space, not necessarily just in the metaverse space. Yeah, well, for us, uh, users are identified using a wallet, a Web3 wallet, such as MetaMask or anyone that supports a Wallet Connect. Uh, so I, I believe privacy there is, uh, it's easy because you can just log in with a new wallet anytime, uh, but also uh, let's create or to customize the experience based on uh, who that wallet is. Uh, so you can get access to, okay, this address, uh, it's a holder of this kind of asset, so we can show you this kind of content. So I think like it's a heads up of what is coming uh, in the future of like, you can choose to build your own digital identity and you can you are free to create a new one anytime and have many many identities in in the central at least um so that's one part and the creative freedom is also super important most of our users well known users in the community they go go by their own like nicknames online and it's crazy when some of my friends hear me talking about like the space and i'm like Canessa, and peanut butter, and, <laughs> and these names are like, what? And, but that's how it is. And that's their identities. And, and I'm super used to it at, at this time. Um, and yeah, we, we have, for example, for the, the creation of digital closes, uh, we take the, the IP very seriously. So if you want to publish, you make your own collection and uh, you want to include a logo there. And uh, you have to submit it to the marketplace and it goes through like a curation process. That the curation committee is elected by our decentralized autonomous organization. So other creators uh, who had experience can apply to be part of that committee uh, and they curate the, the technical aspect of the, 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 the cloth, the piece of uh, the asset. But also they make sure that there is not like a particular brand or a logo that uh, may, may be like IP may be infringed. And mm -hmm. if that is the case, they request like, hey, do you have like a formal authorization on this? And they review the case in particular. So yeah, giving this creative freedom, uh, but also making sure that it's compliant. And uh, like, if there is a future concern, we can, like the, the, this committee can take down the piece. Uh, I think that's the, the tricky part uh, to, to enable the, the discretion freedom, but it's still uh, aligned with the rest of the, the world. That's pretty, that's a pretty cool system you have there. How would you know if, how many people do you usually have on a committee like that? Uh, and I think we have at the moment around 10 people in the committee and they are not active all the time. Uh, it's more like an Uber system in which like, uh, if you are available, you do some yeah. curations and you get paid uh, on performance based on how many curations okay. you did. And is, is usually like someone from the actual Decentraland team also there to make sure that obviously everything is above board? Uh, we kickstart the like the central foundation kick start the curation committee and like overview the processes at the very beginning and uh, when we have like a big search in uh, submissions to the marketplace we onboard more people from the community and they are 
pretty much run by by their own at the moment. We also provide some legal services in terms of like checking IP, uh, making sure that they 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 are in good care. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, committee members at the moment are like recognized builders and creators in this section. Like if you submitted a lot of created a lot of wearables. And you may want to apply to a committee and, and be selected for that. That's a really cool process. I think for people who are obviously very invested in their online activities, I think that's that's a pretty good way to, you know, make money as well. Totally. Yeah, um, it's a job. And they're yeah. super happy, like making a living, not only by selling their collections uh, online, but also be part of the process and understand the, the system and proposing changes. Like if something doesn't feel unf like feel somehow unfair or could be improved, uh, they can send a proposal on the governance platform and like eventually come up with a upgraded version of the system. Okay, that's quite cool. Um, maybe, Yamal, can you tell us a little bit about the Decentraland game jam that you guys have going on? Yeah, totally. So um, every year we host a, like a competition, a call for creators to test out our, our new tools for creating content. So, and that's what Decentraland game jam it's about. Uh, we have two so interesting... Sorry, so is this so is this basically one of the other activities that you guys do offer? So people that see their, you know, while they're in Decentraland, it's also like a job. Yeah, it's a call for creators to like uh, engage in like an overall competition, showcase the the work and creation, and also may win win some prizes uh, along the way. Uh, we're featuring two interesting tools. One is like the latest version of our creative uh, tools, the SDK 7, uh, which has a lot of new features. And so we want the, the community to test it out. Um, and the second aspect is like AI. And uh, there are many applications of AI in like in Decentraland and we want to see what the community builds around that. So speaking of communities, we've seen Decentraland secure some pretty amazing partnerships like La Liga or La Liga Land and the benefits with raffles, meet and greets, merch um, and more. What's in it for you and for La Liga or let's say the overall fan base going forward? What's the mm -hmm. ultimate goal for Decentraland and what do you guys and also in terms of the partners that you plan to bring mm -hmm. to the table. Totally. Um, so for us, we are always looking for brands that can like try to to reinvent themselves and tr try to stick uh, to like their core values and build something on this new medium, this new platform, and find new ways to engage to their own base, the, their own followee, uh, and also leverage the, the novelty of the metaverse and NFTs and like enabling their followees to uh, customize their avatars and identity and engage in, in these new novel ways. Um, for us, is uh, finding the right partners uh, to to build interesting content inside the Central and like test the limits and create new use cases and and that can inspire other companies and other brands as well. Um, we we don't take profit on the, on those uh, activations. We actually try to uh, get the a studio, uh, like there's a really well-known studio building content inside the central and to partner up with these kind of brands. Uh, some of these activations are not actually led by ourselves neither. Like they they, are, they came from like a third party helping them getting into uh, the central and the metaverse. And we provide some support and guidance, but uh, they can build it by, by their own. And uh, I think... Yeah, well, that's the kind of brand we are looking for, like those who are willing to keep truth to their own values and like uh, try new things and try to engage to their audience wherever they are. Um, uh, I think a prime example of this is also Allo. Uh, that's a brand uh, on the wellness and clothing Allo, like space. Allo Yoga, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, they yeah, joined us on the, uh, the fashion week and they created a, like, they give some yoga sessions 
uh, meditation sessions. They created wearables uh, that resembled their offline physical uh, collections in the metaverse. They also created emotes, which are like animations that you can play, uh, like yoga poses in the, the metaverse with your avatar. And I think that they really get the idea of what Decentraline is about and how you can engage the, their audience in, in this new way. And, and I think that's the, the, the brand we're looking for, not, not the ones that are like just for the PR stunt and yeah. they go. Yeah. I mean, who would you be your, like, who's your, let's say your dream partner? If you had to, if you had one, oh. everyone has one. I don't know. Your... I, I, this is a totally personal opinion. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, think, um, I believe like very old IP uh like when i was a kid on the like gaming like from game boy nintendo yeah. i think that something that very appealing from ready player one the movies like you get to see all these like iconic idols from like when you were a kid uh now back in this immersive reality i think that that effect is what i, I would love to see eventually so who's your who's your dream partner Oh, I don't know. I would love to see Who would Pokemon. you love to see? <laughs> like, like, yeah. Pokemon? Um, Pokemon, that would be amazing. Um, we have similar uh, similar gameplays in this entry that doesn't have the IP. Uh, yeah, but having Nintendo getting into the metaverse would be amazing. We, we had Atari uh, in this entry. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. They had a massive piece of land, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they they make an arcade and uh, replicated many of their own old games in in, in this century. So earlier this year, um, I think it was the New York Times who published a report that talked about real estate, um, the next real estate boom, and how it's going to take place in the metaverse. But a lot of critics said that it won't because it obviously it's just a concept. It doesn't. It's a concept doesn't exist, um, and it's like very detached from reality. So with and there's obviously all this talk now about ai ai the famous subject where you have like chat gpt you have open ai and so many others actually there was a whole there was i think a a, a month in which or less than a month where 20 by where over 2000 new ai projects came out um in the last I, I, and this was a few months ago so these are all like these are all technologies that are offering solutions that everyone in the world has been adapting to how do you see the two intersecting with for the mm -hmm. benefit of the metaverse yeah so on the the real estate boom um we have like a big city the open world of the central is called genesis city uh it started in 2017 uh, with like a land auction. Uh, it was originally sold by $10 a plot. Uh, that was like, like the, the base price and all the mana that came from that uh, auction was burned. Uh, so that was how the, the, the real estate in the central came to be. And we have seen like this speculation over the the, the years, like a uh, price of land getting super high and following mostly the cycle of like crypto and also the metaverse. And um, we have activated a, like a rental marketplace. So if you own land, you can also uh, make a profit by renting it and also lowering the barriers for those who want to create inside. Um, we also launched recently the possibility to have your own isolated space uh, that is not part of the open world, but it's you only need to have like a Decentral name, uh, your name, uh, so you have your own private space inside Decentral, and also lowers the barrier of building uh, inside our platform. Uh, so that's one side. Then AI, AI is amazing on. Uh, how it it's helps. also dangerous. <laughs> it's dangerous. I, yes, yes, for sure. Yeah. We have to do it with with care, uh, okay. and uh, it probably will accelerate many of the 
not so good things were saying on like online and how synthetic yeah. content has become and how boring everything is when you go through the, like the mainstream platforms and the doom scrolling uh, and mm -hmm. like we'll just get more tools to create that kind of content that is not very healthy and also like algorithm engage on uh, optimize just to keep you engaged and like I I I think I see what's what's the danger and humanity already uh, engaged with AI on like advertisement side and uh, it's uh. not very healthy I believe. However, on the creator side, there is a bright side of AI and um, I I believe we're following AI very closely on two fronts. The first one is the the creation of 3D models based on text. Uh, NVIDIA has a, a, a model that is quite good and also OpenAI just released a, a, also another version. Um, and, and that's lowering the entry barrier for many people because now if you want to say, I want a sofa or I want a, a I don't know, just build me a garden and you get a 3D model just from that text prompt. Otherwise you need to learn Blender and I get a lot of tools that probably yeah. mainstream people don't use. So I think on the creative side, that's uh, promising. And the other uh, aspect of uh, AI I'm very into is like the creation of a virtual host. Uh, every time you, you think about like the metaverse or an event or like having your own some sort of website in the metaverse. Okay, it's a build with your house, with all the information, but you expect someone to receive you and to host you and explain you, walk you around. And you can do it with a real person, like in a live event, you can assign like people to be greeters in the, the activation. But if you want to have like evergreen content uh, that is always engaging, having some sort of virtual host, uh, an identity that can like welcome you, get the information of who you are, who is your address, who are in, you are interested on, and craft a narrative based on you. I think that's super powerful. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm very bullish on, on AI on Metaverse. So do you think that like with, when it comes to AI and real estate, they do you think there's going to be a, point of time where it's going to obviously they're going to work like it's going to intersect for the benefit of like part living or having properties within the metaverse yeah totally i, I think the the ai helps the building content inside the the real estate and adds more value to uh, the real state of of the metaverse so i, I totally see the the their connection there and, and how they complement very well together yeah Let's see if that comes it comes soon. I think that a lot of people are expecting to see quite a lot of um, progress with that in the next, I think, within by the next bull run. So I think it's quite, I'm quite interested to see how that's going to go. Um, myself, personally, I'm on the side of not necessarily a critic, but I would just think like I don't feel like buying land or buying a house in the metaverse or real estate makes sense for me personally. But I can understand how it makes sense for others ish. Yeah. How would, you, how would you explain that? So like if you if you have to convince me why it's like a good idea. Yeah. Do you own property in the real world? It's no. in <laughs> uh... that's why. <laughs> Well, yeah, I do have I guess, like a little bit, but not not nothing like that's like. If know. you if you want to like if you have a brand or if you have like a business and you want to get some like food traffic and activate people, uh, you get to you need to get a location that uh, it's a uh, well known that uh, receive a lot of people there. Uh, you want to be probably next to someone that uh, already has an interesting thing to offer or a commercial area. Uh, you, If you are building a business, I mean, in the real world, uh, you need to be very yeah. strategic in where you place it. And uh, and that's a huge market. Like New York is New York because of that. Yeah. And like many cities are uh, like 
great I mean, focus on, your, on a niche. I, I see the same happening on, online as well. I mean, I can understand it from a from like a commercial perspective, because like like for instance, like the property I have is like it's like not property that I'm renting out, you know, because it's places I'm gonna be staying in, where like if I'm in Egypt or if I'm in you know, like in whatever kind in Bali, like these are properties to live in that I wouldn't love. Like I wouldn't be like, oh, I need to rent this out. But if I have property in the metaverse, obviously I would want to rent it out. But how big is that market? For... Yeah, it, it for sure is a uh, way smaller than like the property that you use for like a basic need as living, and but on like real estate as uh, getting attention of people, uh, similar yeah. to advertisement, like you place a like a big ad in a newspaper, and on the first page is huge. Uh, because it gets the attention. It's all about attention, I think, on the digital yeah. world. Okay, this is sort of um, not necessarily on the same subject. And I, I don't know if that we're going to keep this in just in case. It might be a bit too sensitive. But obviously, we all know what, like, you, we've seen the news. So you saw, like, the submarine for the Titanic, the tour, the Titanic tour. I was, when I was looking, when I was reading about it, my first thought was, why would they not send down like without humans right like just send out like send down like a camera and take a full virtual yeah. tour mm -hmm. and then then make that you know if you want to pay for it go and visit it within through the meta like through the metaverse yeah like would yeah that that's not a good point been, would that not have, i watched it and i was Literally. like i was like i don't want to say anything but <laughs> couldn't that have been something yeah. like Apple Vision Pros like cost thousands of dollars. They couldn't have like just thought, oh, that might be a good yeah. way to do it. Yeah, I, actually, uh, let me give me uh, give you something about myself. Uh, I'm very into drones. Uh, okay. I like to fly drones and also building them. Uh, oh, yeah, and there is a, a ranch of like drone racing and. That's something I, I, I did for a while. Um, when you race a drone, you do it like a, on first person view. So you have these goggles you yeah. put and you drive it like in, and you see it in first person. FPV is the name uh, if you want to check out videos on, on YouTube. And uh, yeah, and, and the feeling is quite amazing. And there is a a, a company that builds some chips like the, the video transmission system and they call it a, a real virtuality because you have this feeling of like this is real life uh, but you are commanding the machine like on like in a remote distance and it's mm -hmm. virtual but if you make a mistake and if you crash the drone that's a real pain you know you have to then go look for it fix yeah. it it again uh, so for example the case of the titanic they could like send a drone and recreate the experience or even if you get it to a more real life thing you can like command the drone directly in real life i, I just feel like they could have done so many things before sending humans you know what i mm. mean i just was like they maybe they did but like if they didn't work then this was obviously not the next best thing but yeah, that was that was one thing. You know what? With your drone hobby, if I did not know you were an engineer before, I know it now. <laughs> Building <laughs> drones and racing them. I was like, I don't even know where you'd start. To I'd have to buy the drone, take off a piece, and then put it back on, and that would be me building it. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much as a like building a PC computer. You buy the parts <laughs> and then you connect them. Yeah, just I guess that's just an engineer thing. Not for <laughs> yeah, very. A small niche, I guess. Yeah, yeah. no, but it's it's pretty cool. Like, I think that's it's really like if you know how to do it, that's a really impressive skill to have. But no, yeah, I don't think I have any more questions for you, Yemel. But um, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. I had a really great time today. Good chat. <laughs> thank you so much, Tina. It was a pleasure for me to be here. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Decoded. Um, as always, please like and subscribe and comment whoever you'd like to see 
in the next episode. And I hate this part. Okay, bye. (laughs)